BCY America presents Crosstalk, a nationwide call-in program discussing issues that have an effect on our families, our communities, our churches, our nation, and our world. Crosstalk, an opportunity for you to voice your concerns for biblical principles. And now live by satellite and around the world on the Internet at vcyamerica.org. Here is today's Crosstalk. Thank you, Mr. Morris, and welcome to Crosstalk. Good to have you with us, have you with us today. And uh, we're going to be talking about what's happening right now in the Supreme Court yesterday and today. And uh, probably one of the most effective and uh, on uh, the cutting edge organizations I can think of is the Liberty Council and a longtime friend. And no stranger on VCY America is Matt Staver, the founder and chairman of Liberty Council. And Matt's with us today. Hi, Matt. How are you doing? Very good. Good to be with you, Vic. You had a busy two days. Yes, this is a significant time in American history because what we have right now is the definition of marriage before the United States Supreme Court. Potentially could be decided by five individuals that are not elected and really not accountable to the people. So I think this is... Whenever you put marriage in the hands of five people to determine its outcome, I mean, it's an awesome time to be in prayer. Uh, and it certainly, I think, uh, sheds a light on how we have become unbalanced in our system of government. You know, Matt, as we look at America today and the issues of morality in the broader spectrum, we have seen the decay uh, when when you throw God's word out, the Ten Commandments, uh, and uh all of the issues that have given us foundation for our our faith and our uh, behavior. And all of a sudden, I mean, it's thrown God out. We throw everything out. The kids in school don't even know uh, what's right or wrong anymore. And now we've got a whole generation that's moved into the area of legislation. Yeah, and, you know, right now we have before the United States Supreme Court two cases. We've got Proposition 8 out of California involving the state constitutional amendment that affirmed marriage, didn't define marriage, affirmed marriage as the union of one man and one woman. Mm -hmm. In the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, that does the same thing for our federal purposes in terms of federal benefits. This issue has huge ramifications because if for some reason five justices were to say that there's a constitutional right to same-sex marriage and therefore you can't have a marriage amendment in California or other other places and you can't affirm it in a federal law, then that will have catastrophic changes and impact on our morality, on our free exercise of religion, on the freedom of speech, on just literally blatant immorality that will take place with regards to teaching not just same-sex couples or tolerance, but same-sex aberrant sexual activity and behavior within the public schools beginning in kindergarten. We're going to see this because we know that it's already happened in places like Massachusetts and elsewhere that have adopted same-sex marriage. Matt, yesterday the court heard the oral arguments on Prop 8. Uh, What stands out to you about yesterday's hearing? Uh, Obviously there are little flags when you hear the discussion by the justices, uh, things that give you a little hint at least. Well, you don't really know exactly where the justices are going to go. I think the Obamacare case certainly underscored that. We all thought the court was going to go five to four, at least to strike down Obamacare across the board. And that's the way it actually voted at the end of the week. That's the way the original opinion was written. But then Roberts changed his vote in the middle of the writing phase and came out and switched his vote and thus upheld the individual mandate by one vote. So we really don't know. But at least from what we can tell, we know at least this from this week's hearings. The justices with regards to Proposition 8 are uncomfortable making a broad rule that will affect the entire country and ultimately undermine the institution of marriage. They made comments such as that uh, same-sex marriage is newer, more recent than cell phones or the Internet. And in fact, in the world during our lifetime, it's only been in existence since 2000. Now, we've had it in the Roman Empire, and we've had it in other places throughout history. But in our lifetime, it's only been in existence since 2000, and that was in the Netherlands, Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. And we've seen the social experiment fail there. And so one of the things they're concerned with is, with so little information about it, you want us to rewrite the definition of marriage, and we can't predict the future. That was one of their concerns. So I don't think there's a majority of justices that are willing to cross that threshold 
and push same-sex marriage across the country. Okay. What they might do, though, is they might ultimately find that the Proposition 8 proponents lack what they call is standing. And if that's the case, they could dismiss the case and not even address the merits of the case. What would ultimately result is this. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision would be overturned, and that would leave potentially only the Northern District of California Lower Trial Court, Judge Von Walker's decision. Now, that could still remain standing, the impact of which would only be to cover one-third of California, the northern part of California, San Francisco and up in that area, not the central or southern, and certainly not outside of California. So what we'd have is continued battles in California over this issue, but it would be isolated. Now, they possibly could even set aside that entire lower court hearing, and everyone would have to start it all over from beginning uh, as um, – as though the case never even existed. Now, it's kind of interesting how the, the uh, homosexual uh, agenda people were playing funny games with uh, Justice Roberts' cousin. She be, uh, Just prior to yesterday, I mean, the press were all over it, the fact that he had a cousin who was reported to be a lesbian, and uh, but her comments uh, that uh, believing that he would vote to allow same-sex marriage uh, you know, they were playing with this as, as a publicity thing, uh, even talking about where she'd be seated in the courtroom, etc. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well, I think if it's true that she was actually there, and, and it seems as though she was based upon the public reports, that it was probably inappropriate of the just Chief Justice to even allow that distraction. Mm-hmm. Now, it, according to the reports, she inquired from the Chief Justice's sister and got the seats. But I'm sure that the Chief Justice would have known about that, and I would think that he would not want that kind of distraction. Uh, But one of the things that I've seen is that the media had a concerted effort to try to paint this picture, that politicians and Republican supporters in the George W. Bush administration and the polls and all this momentum was going towards same-sex marriage. They wanted to push an avalanche before the Supreme Court to say, listen, everything's going this way. You ought to just get in line and go the same way. So I think there was a concerted effort. I think this was part of that public media campaign that was being waged by the homosexual agenda and being in complicit with the mainstream or liberal media. It seems that there are two areas that are uh, used as tools within this. Number one is uh, public opinion. And number two, the redefinition of issues. Yeah, you know, and public opinion has always, always been wrong when it comes to predict whether or not a state constitutional marriage amendment will pass. It has never been right. In every state, 30 states that have gone to the polls since the mid-1990s to pass state constitutional marriage amendments have always underpolled by at least 5%, if not 10 to even greater percent. In other words, the polls were predicting that a particular marriage amendment was going to pass by, say, 55 percent when it actually passed by 65 percent, or it would predict it was going to pass by 65 percent and it actually passed by 65 to 82 percent. The problem is is that these polls always underpredicted. We had the same situation in Florida. We had to get the 60 percent threshold. And the polls constantly predict, predicted we're not going to break the 60 percent. Well, we did break the 60 percent, and we got the constitutional amendment in Florida. So I don't really trust these polls, and frankly, it depends on how the polls are worded. But irrespective of whether they're worded objectively and whether people really understand the implications of this or not, we can't have our moral compass set by a popularity opinion poll. Marriage is the foundation of who we are as a culture, as humanity. It has a significant uh, procreative and an environment in which children are raised, where they are best raised up. It has a spiritual component. Uh, We know from just natural existence and natural observation and natural law, and obviously from revealed law and from common sense, that marriage is the union of one man and one woman. And to try to put that to a popularity contest, it would be like saying, 
well, should we vote on whether you ought to have free exercise of religion? Should we vote on whether you ought to have the freedom to speak, the right to a conscience where government doesn't coerce it? Should we put that up to a popularity uh, contest? Or should we even vote on whether or not you have a right to life? And should we vote on whether or not it's day or night? Does it really matter what our vote is in that matter? So that's essentially, I think, the flaw with these popularity opinion polls. Interestingly enough, too, uh, Matt, uh, it was ABC and CNN, uh, as they published some of their findings of how many people were in favor of same-sex marriage, uh, their sampling was only uh, just a little over a thousand people, uh, which, from a scientific standpoint, uh, doesn't really begin to give you uh, a good sampling that gives you uh, reliable numbers. But uh, it, it doesn't, it's, give, you, it it may, doesn't sure. give you good sampling at all. And in no. fact, if you if you ultimately word the question, are you uh, do you believe that uh, people who are in a loving, committed relationship yeah, right. ought to be able to have uh, the benefits of marriage like other heterosexual couples do? Um, you know, if you put it in that kind of a context, then people might say one thing. But if you actually put this down to what it really is, same-sex marriage, let's get down to the bottom line. Same-sex marriage is not marriage. It is a deconstruction of marriage. It ultimately is not including same-sex couples in marriage. It's redefining the institution of marriage. And as a policy matter, as a policy matter, what this says is that children don't need moms or dads. Think about it. Same-sex marriage, if you're saying this is what we ought to aspire to and this is what the government's going to wrap all these laws around to protect because it is so core to who we are, that means that boys don't need fathers, yeah. that fathers for these young boys are absolutely irrelevant to their well-being. Well, anyone who has any common sense or has visited a jail and talked to the men in the violent offender section of the jail would know that that's simply ludicrous, that boys do need fathers, that male and female, moms and dads, make a significant difference in the well-being of boys and girls. You know, as we as we see the comments, uh, one website indicated that if the court strikes down marriage as we know it, that it would be the same as pronouncing the death sentence on America that many of us know and love. The the recount the the, the days of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, as being uh, returning to our culture. Your thoughts? Well, I think so. You know, same sex marriage is ultimately the abolition of gender. It's ultimately the abolition of any moral behavior with regards to human sexuality. This whole assault on marriage is really an attempt to obliterate not only morality, but Judeo-Christian morality, to obliterate marriage, and to even obliterate the idea that there is a God. And that goes back to Alfred Kinsey back in 48 and 53 mm-hmm. with his books on sexuality in the human male and sexuality in the human female. He wanted to remove all restrictions on human sexuality to destroy the Judeo-Christian ethic and morality and marriage. He hated God, and he wanted to destroy the very notion that there is a God, and the best way to do that is to just simply remove all restrictions of right and wrong, moral restrictions, and human sexuality. Matt Staver, our guest today, founder and chairman of Liberty Council, talking about what's happening at the Supreme Court. We've got more to come, so stay with us. We'll be back in 60 seconds. This is Crosstalk. Back to Genesis with Dr. John Morris, scientist with the Institute for Creation Research. Dr. Morris, I've heard about the flagella of bacteria. What are they? Chris, the flagella of the tiny one-celled E. coli bacteria are hair-like things extending from each cell, which allows it to propel itself along. Its connection to the cell is marvelous. It can rotate in either direction and stop instantaneously and go the other way. Better and more complex than modern machinery. God has designed even simple cell organisms by his creativity and intelligence. The more we learn, the more difficulty evolution has in trying to explain their origin through mutations. Surely some things cannot be. All things must have been created by the Creator back in Genesis. Thanks, Dr. Morris. If you want to know more about the creation evolution issue, visit us on the web at www.icr.org. That's www.icr.org. 
I'm Chris O'Brien. Thanks for tuning in. And welcome back to Crosstalk. Today, as we're talking with Matt Staver, the founder and chairman of Liberty Council, an organization that's the best friend that the church, the family, your your community has in dealing with these issues. And uh, they're standing by there at the Supreme Court watching what's happening. And uh, I just want you to have a website because there's lots of information. And uh, if any of you have never uh, accessed this website, let me give it to you right now. It's very simple. Just LC. Dot org, lc. Dot org. You'll find vital information and opportunities to be uh, involved in Liberty Alert, where there are things that are happening, and uh, have this. I, I get the Liberty Alert all the time, right there on my website, Matt, and I, I see what's happening, and you keep us well informed. Well, you can always go to lc. dot org. In fact, we have been posting uh, information there about the court hearings this week, and we'll continue to do so. We actually filed a brief in each case, the Proposition Eight case, and also the Federal Defense of Marriage Act case. But we have a lot of information that's available for you to learn about what your liberties are, and also inform us whenever you know of liberties that are being threatened. That's how we can get involved, and when we get involved, most often we win. Uh, Matt, uh, I'm going to divert just for a moment because I am fully aware at your law school there at Liberty uh, Liberty University and the uh, Liberty Council uh, Ministry to young attorneys, training young attorneys to defend our liberties. And I remember when you set the law school up there uh, in Lynchburg, you not only set up courtrooms where young attorneys could get uh, used to the environment, but you also created what you call a moot courtroom uh, that is the exact replica of the Supreme Court. Yeah, that's right. It's the only place in the country that actually has an exact replica of the bench of the United States Supreme Court. I mean, we use the exact blueprints and diagrams from the U.S. Supreme Court to construct this bench. And, in fact, just this past weekend, we had nine real judges from around the country, two federal courts of appeal judges, both of them the chief judge of their individual circuit courts of appeal, and also a state Supreme Court justice, even from your state, uh, Vic, Wisconsin. We had one of your state Supreme Court justices there to judge our final round of competition. I will actually, uh, in the next couple of weeks, be preparing an argument in that courtroom for a major argument that I'm doing April 17 out in San Francisco on the change therapy case. And then after that, I'll be preparing another argument uh, May 16 before the Federal Court of Appeals on the Obamacare case. So our students will be able to see real time these major cases that are actually prepared and uh, argued right there in the courtroom. Since the founding of the the law school, how many uh, attorneys have you graduated there? Well, we've graduated uh, several hundred uh, attorneys already since uh, our first graduation class of 2007. And uh, this year, we, in 2012, we had our first elected officials, one who is a state uh, representative in Texas, Matthew Krause. He worked for Liberty Council, and now he's a state representative in Texas. We have our first county commissioner. We have people that are working uh, in uh, congressional offices in Washington, D.C. We have them working for federal and state judges around the country in private practice and media and entertainment corporations. We have them even teaching at law schools already. So they are in amazing demand. Some of them are in ministry. They're in all different kinds of uh, businesses and various areas where they're using the rule of law that they've learned from their Christian training and experience at Liberty to impact the culture, not only here in America, but literally even around the world. Matt, uh, I had the privilege many years ago to be on your board of directors, and I remember when the law school was simply an idea. You were just talking about it. And to see it today and how God is using it in uh, building champions to deal with those issues that affect all of us. Yeah, you know, it's an amazing uh, dream that came true. And, uh, you know, God really has blessed Liberty University School of Law. I encourage anyone who's going, who's considering law school, you got to go to a place that really respects the rule of law and will train you from a Christian worldview perspective to appreciate law. Many of these secular law schools, they deconstruct law. And it's like going to study math. If you really love math and you love higher math and learn how to use it so you can solve problems and so forth, 
But if you go to an instructor that says 2 plus 2 used to equal 4, but now mm-hmm. in my classroom it equals 5, and sometimes I can make it even equal 6, you know, that deconstructs the very foundation of math. If you can't trust the founding principles of math, how can you trust more complex formulas? It's the same with law. You go to a law school and they deconstruct law, or you go to a seminary and they deconstruct the scriptures so they don't believe in the Bible, they don't believe in God. Mm. How kind of an education are you going to get? That's the kind of thing that happens for students when they go to secular law schools. Law is literally deconstructed for them. And uh, this idea of justice that they had when they come into law school is shattered by the time they finish. At Liberty, we continue to fan the flames of that passion and give you a grounding so that you can be used by God in whatever area God has called you to and make a huge difference in your community and even around the world. If I remember correctly, when the school applied for acceptance through the proper channels and and, uh, recognition in academia, I think it was one of the fastest approvals uh, in history, was it not? That's right. We had the fastest accreditation uh, in history at the time. One school has since tied us, but no school can ever beat us. It's the (laughs) fastest you could possibly do it. In fact, Vic, just a few weeks ago, Liberty University School of Law's arbitration trial team competition, we were named number one in the entire nation. So we are the number one law school in the country of all law schools for uh, arbitration competition. Just came away with the national championship a few weeks ago. Folks, be in prayer for these young men and women who are preparing to deal with the issue of law and uh, men and women who understand what right and wrong is because it's based on the principles of God's law. Well, Matt, let's get back to this thing uh, that we've been talking about uh, uh, the homosexual involvement in the same-sex marriage thing in Prop 8. Uh, what is in the world is happening within the GOP? Uh, there's been a lot of talk that the GOP should endorse same-sex marriage, with Senator Rob Portman just defecting from the platform. Uh, RNC chairman, the actual chairman of the Republican National Convention, telling his fellow uh, GOP members to get into the 21st century with same-sex marriage issues. I can't believe what I'm hearing. You know, it's like going into a a, a building at night and you flip on the lights and all of a sudden the cockroaches start running. (laughs) Yes. And I think the same-sex marriage issue has shown the cockroaches within the Republican Party, the rhinos, Republican in name only. I mean, it's why we lost the 2008 election. It's why we lost the 2012 election, because they put forth their party person who's not really conservative and doesn't resonate with the American people and couldn't con- couldn't carry a conservative message and articulate it if it was handed to him. And so what we have is, you know, you go back to George W. Bush. George W. Bush surrounded himself by a number of people that have uh, were not conservative. And, in fact, though he was elected in 2004 on a marriage mandate, that's what ultimately pushed him across the line. Remember, that was the time where 13 states passed constitutional amendments, 11 of them actually on the day uh, he was elected. And Ohio was a key state, and Ohio had marriage on the ballot. That pushed him over the top. He had a marriage mandate. And coming into 2005, we asked him to push forward with a federal marriage amendment. Instead, he and Karl Rove backed away. They tried to reform Social Security, which was not a mandate of his, and he failed, and we lost that opportunity. And so now you have Karl Rove and you have, you know, Priebus and some others, Portman. Um, They're going down a a way that uh, ultimately would split the Republican Party. I can tell you what. If the Republican Party were to adopt same-sex marriage, they were to do that, evangelicals will leave in mass, and that will create a third party. You know, no one wants to create a third party. They want to work within the system. They want to make sure that it advances freedom and liberty and our sanctity of life and marriage. But if the Republican Party goes down that road, you can bet there will be a mass exodus from that party, and it will not win elections again for many, many years in the future. You know, Matt, as we look back uh, to a term that isn't new, but they call them log cabin uh GOP, you know, log cabin Republicans. And that, of course, was the group that favored homosexual involvement and uh, moral uh, decadence, and as I, that's how I define it. Uh, but this was the liberal element. And when I saw that happen years ago, down in my heart, I thought, is there nobody to clean the, clean the cockroaches out? Why do you coexist with that? Well, we need people listening to this radio broadcast now, and that's one of the reasons why we're trying to train up a new generation 
who will not only um, encourage people to be conservative and educate them, but also vote these people out of office that are not uh, carrying these conservative fundamental first principle values. Or we also need people to run for office as well and get people out there who are preparing and working their way up to run for office and run for it on the local state scale and the state scale, and then perhaps even on a national level as well. What we have a problem with is not the values of the message. We have the problem with candidates who won't articulate the message. Uh, we have uh, people who simply haven't thought about marriage, and therefore when they're confronted with it, it's just who they know, somebody that they might know that's gay or lesbian, homosexual, and now their values are shaped by that. The fact of the matter is, Liberty Council and I and others, we've been involved in this battle for a number of years. Let's look at real facts. Let's look at the Netherlands. When the Netherlands brought in same-sex unions in 2000, what happened? People stopped getting married mm -hmm. because the institution of marriage was devalued. If you go there, you can even empirically look at it. In addition to the scientific studies, women are pushing baby carriages everywhere. Why? Because the men are not being committed to the marriage. They're having the sexual activity in relationships, but they're not committing to marriage. So many, many children are being born out of wedlock. We know that that causes a problem not only with the well-being of these children, but it also makes that family poorer. Children born out of wedlock are typically raised in a more economically depressed environment. They have less opportunity. They have less opportunity with regards to even understanding uh, male and female, moms and dads, how to raise a strong family themselves. It's disintegrated the institution of marriage. Now go to Massachusetts and look at that particular area. What's happened to religious free exercise of religion? Well, the Catholic Charities had to stop its ministry of adoption that it had been involved in for decades because under this new law in Massachusetts, they would have to place children in homes with same-sex moms or dads, and they refused to do it because of their religious beliefs. And also in that state, parents sent their kids to a public school, and they're taught about Heather has two mommies or the king and the king. When they object, uh, they're told, you have no right to object. We've got to teach this in the public schools, not only about alternative families, but different kinds of aberrant sexual activities. In Vermont, for example, the state is funding. I can't even speak of what it's funding on this program because it would violate FCC regulations. It's that blatant. It's that absolutely offensive. It is the worst kind of sexual activity being taught in the public schools that you can imagine. You would just be shocked by what's being done under state grants in that particular state to push this homosexual agenda, a state now that has adopted same-sex marriage. We're going to put our children and grandchildren into that situation. In the Massachusetts situation, when the parents objected, one of the parents got arrested for objecting objecting to what his child was being subjected to in the public school and ultimately lost the legal battle in that case because same-sex marriage was the law of the land. You're going to have people lose their professions. You're going to have parents lose their rights. You're going to have churches and other you know, avenues of religious free exercise ultimately throttled, and marriage and morality are going to tumble. Children are ultimately going to pay the price, and society will suffer. We're going to be back in just 60 seconds. Matt Staver, our guest today, and we're talking about what's happening in the Supreme Court and what's happening in our country. Don't miss it. We'll be right back. We are living in a world where truth is diluted to each man's opinion, and faith is assembled from a smorgasbord of self-help varieties. In the book, Buyer Beware, author Janet Parshall draws a parallel from the classic work, The Pilgrim's Progress, to show that the message of truth cannot be bought and sold like a commodity, but must be lived out by believers in the public square. She examines some of the most controversial issues being debated in our culture today, by looking at them through the lens of Scripture. She also uses the prophet Jeremiah's letter, to show how a people held in a sin-fallen world can live abundantly and triumphantly. The book is designed to encourage modern-day saints as they enter the marketplace by helping them discover the richness of God's Word and the poverty of the world's message. 
Buyer Beware is available for a donation of $18 or more to VCY America by calling 1-800-729-9829. That's toll free, 1-800-729-9829. And welcome back to Crosstalk as our guest, Matt Staver, founder and chairman of Liberty Council, uh, an international nonprofit litigation, education and policy organization dedicated to advancing religious freedom and sanctity of life and the family. And if you'd like more information about Liberty Council, it's lc.org, lc.org. Just go to that website and you can find out more information, communicate with them. And I'm sure that, I mean, if you're not aware of what's going on, folks, this is one place to find out, lc.org. Well, Matt, as we were talking about, uh, of course, what's happening with uh, Rob Portman and uh, uh, Priebus, uh, who is actually the chairman of the RNC, uh, and uh, others who have kind of signed on, uh, we taking a look at there are some mighty voices that are saying, you do this and I'm out of here. One is Gary Bauer. Uh, another, I think, Tony Perkins. What what are your thoughts there? Well, I'm with them as well. I'm out of there. Uh, I know a lot of people that are, and I would encourage as many people also to follow. Uh, this is not something that can be tolerated. It would be like a, a platform that adopts abortion as its uh, platform. Uh, you just can't be a part of something like that. You can't be a part of death, and you can't be a part of the destruction of marriage. You know, same-sex marriage... If it is okay, then what it means is literally children don't need moms or dads. Mm -hmm. It means moms and dads are irrelevant, that they're just an appendage. They're okay, but they're not necessary. You know, I challenge anyone that has that idea, go with me or go with someone to a jail, any jail. I don't care what county or city or state you're in. Go to the jail, ask them to visit the men's section and the violent offender section and ask them one question. And the question is, where was your dad when you were growing up? Universally, you will have the response, I had no father. Yeah, That's not a coincidence that they had a fatherless household. It's not saying everyone who is raised in a fatherless household becomes a criminal, but it is to say that it exponentially increases your likelihood of becoming one. Uh, You can look at every conceivable area, every measurable area in terms of education, mental and physical health, economic income, stability of marriage, every conceivable measurable area. Children do best when they're raised in an environment with mom and dad. It's just plain and simple. Same-sex marriage says it doesn't matter whether you have mom or dad. Do we really want to adopt that kind of a policy as a policy of our government and support it by laws and promote it as the highest ideal to achieve. I mean, if you go to the Center for Disease Control, it's not a right-wing organization, and go to their website right now and look at research regarding the harmful physical effects of same-sex activity. Mm. It's there. It's prevalent. Same-sex activity is not normal. It is harmful. And we want to adopt something that encourages that as an ideal. We want to encourage that into our public schools. It's absolutely absurd to cross that precipice and adopt that as a platform. And, Matt, if there's ever a day that uh, young people in our churches need to hear thundering from the pulpit, those same precepts of this being a violation of God's plan and not just a social experiment, this is, this is sin, spelled S-I-N, uh, today, sin has uh, become just a, an optional viewpoint uh, because you don't want to be legalistic. You don't want to be uh, dogmatic. We want to be accepting and we want to be tolerant and all this type of thing. But if this same-sex marriage thing goes through, Matt, what uh, what's down the road? Polygamy? Well, it is polygamy. Uh, there is no way legally or logically you can stop polygamy if you sanction same-sex marriage. There's just no way. In fact... Polygamists are making the argument and have been making the argument. The ACLU has made the argument uh, with regards to polygamy using the same arguments from same-sex marriage. If somebody says, 
but, you know, I have an affinity to somebody of the same sex, and I can't marry. I want to be able to marry because marriage is about feelings towards one another. If marriage devolves to just simply feelings towards one another, uh, then you can marry anyone. And, in fact, same-sex marriage would open the door to marrying uh, a man having two women or two men having two women. Right now, uh, people are having cross a fertilization and, and cross artificial insemination where you have literally two men in a household and two women in the household and they're cross inseminating each other and uh, cross adopting the children so that the children actually have four parents i mean what is happening is an absurd situation you go back to the early founding of the country and there were some con there were some states or territories that had polygamy as their their way of life and it wasn't just Utah. As a prerequisite to allow these territories to become states, they were required to abandon polygamy and adopt marriage as one man and one woman. Why? Because the founders and the early people of the country realized that the security of the country depended upon strong families. And strong families are not created in a polygamous or certainly not a same-sex household environment. You know, Matt, uh, in addition, of course, to the feedback that's coming from the uh, different sides of the aisle here, corporate America has been leaning more and more to this same-sex marriage thing. One of the most vocal has been Starbucks Coffee, who's told a shareholder opposed to their stand for same-sex marriage that he should sell his shares. Your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I know Tom Strobar. He's a good uh, friend of mine, and he has gone to this corporate board meeting, and he asked them about this issue. And the head of Starbucks said, you ought to sell your shares and go someplace else. We don't want you. Well, if that's the case, you know, I don't think people ought to patronize Starbucks either, uh, because what you're doing is you're just uh, patronizing a company that's going to use your money against your own values. Uh, you know, what we have are these companies – that instead of our being neutral with regards to the economic issue, they're becoming advocates for homosexuality. And one of the things that happened with the Boy Scouts was a couple of companies, AT&T and Ernst & Young, the CEOs of both of those companies, uh, began to pull their money out of funding the National Boy Scouts. And the Boy Scouts were going to vote to change the policy and allow open homosexuals to be scoutmasters, for example. That's like having Jerry Sandusky as a scoutmaster. What oh. parent in their right mind would send their young boy out into the woods overnight camping with Jerry Sandusky as a scoutmaster who's actually looking at their young boys and has a sexual desire for them? I mean, it's absolutely crazy. When the Boy Scouts did that in Canada... They ultimately lost their membership. I think it dropped from like 200,000 to 100,000 wow. in a short period of time hmm. because the scouts lost who they were. And parents in the right mind said, we're not going to send our children in harm's way. Mm -mm. You know, I think what we need to do as individuals is we need to be as strong in our values and put them in practice in, in our corporate, and our spending life, and our Amen. everyday communities the way some of these left-leaning liberals do. Starbucks is an example of a left-leaning liberal organization that's using its money to push the homosexual agenda. Conservatives and people of faith and values need to be just as strong on the opposite end. And so let your church be notified if they have during the coffee hour, <laughs> Starbucks coffee. Uh, well, enough said, okay. Uh, last questions, Matt, we're going to open our phone lines. Timetable for the Supreme Court, when will they make their decision and when will the public find out? Well, the timetable will be to have a decision by the end of June. That's when their term ends. So we'll know then, since this case was argued uh, in late March, we know it's a big case. Both of them are big, so they're going to be some of the last ones decided. It'll come down the end of June, you know, based upon the Defense of Marriage Act arguments. While Proposition 8 could be dismissed and limited in its scope by the Supreme Court, the Defense of Marriage Act case could also be dismissed because of a similar standing problem. But on the other hand, there is some suggestion that there's at least five justices, including Kennedy, uh, that don't like the Defense of Marriage Act. So they might jump over this standing hurdle that they've got there as well and go to the merits. And uh, we just don't know what that particular ruling would look like, but it could have a far-reaching impact. 
Matt, do you believe that uh, people should be praying that God in some way should convict those people of high standing or our justices, that somehow that they would receive wisdom, true godly wisdom on this? Absolutely, I do. I mean, we live at a very critical moment where we're several months away from the potential of redefining the marriage institution. The implications of that in many ways is staggering. If a Supreme Court were to cross that line, in my view, it would become an illegitimate arbiter of the rule of law and will have morphed into a political machine. It will have lost all of its legitimacy if it moves into that realm, because there is no way you can stretch or finagle the Constitution to come up with a right to same-sex marriage or to come up with a part of the Constitution that says a state cannot affirm the long-standing, universal, naturally understood definition of marriage as the union of one man and one woman. Matt Staver, our guest today, the founder and president of uh, Liberty Council and uh, the law school there, Liberty Law School, with hundreds of young attorneys now entering the the force there to stand up for liberty. We're going to open our phone lines right now if you'd like to call and chat. We have limited time, but we'll take your calls as quickly as possible. Uh, Anywhere on the planet, it's toll-free, 800-733-9829, 800-733-9829 if you'd like to call. And... uh, at this moment, uh, the uh, lines are almost jammed already as your calls come in. 800 9829 That's our numbers here. And uh, Matt Staver standing by. Keep your questions brief and to the point. Our lines are now jammed. And so uh, we would ask that uh, you be uh, direct in your questions. And uh, in the meantime, Matt, we're asking people to pray for Liberty Council. You're on the cutting edge, and you're out there defending the church, the family, the community with godly principles. And uh, we would pray that God would bless the entire team and uh, all the folks in the home office as well, because I know that's a busy beehive for sure. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we uh, we certainly have been very involved in this case and will continue to be involved. We've, we've defended over 50 cases regarding the definition of marriage, and we're going to continue to be involved and keep people uh, informed uh, regarding this case. And we'll continue to put information up on our website at lc.org. South Dakota Anonymous, you're on the air with Matt Staver. Go ahead. Um, hello. Um, I was uh, raped several different times when I was a, a young man, and uh, I was too small to stop the individual's. And uh, it occurred over several years, in fact. And it had a profound effect on me. I was terribly rebellious, did everything imaginably wrong. In fact, uh, I nearly killed the boy. Um, <clears throat> we were in a fight, and uh, I, I was just so bitter that uh, I was always very, very angry. And I truly almost killed this boy who later became best friend. And uh, I can understand why prisons are so full of young boys and, and, uh, well, young ladies, too, who don't have a good home life, because I didn't. uh, Mm. That abuse affected me um, for 35 years or so. Matt, your thoughts? Yeah, you know, if you want to call our number, it's at 800 671 1776, 800-671-1776, and uh, speak to Richard uh, or uh, someone else there. Um, We've got resources that we work with around the country, and your story is something that we've heard many times. That's why I think this issue of same-sex marriage, breaking down the family, the impact that it would have on kids is incalculable in terms of the damage that it would have on children. And so uh, I want to follow this back up after the break. 800-671-1776 to call Liberty Council. We'll be right back. For the Worldview Weekend Minute, I'm Brennan House. Our website's worldviewweekend.com. Continuing on our series on money and a biblical worldview, 20 principles for having a biblical worldview for money. We now pick up on point number four. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and compromise. First Timothy chapter six, verse nine speaks to this. You know, people that desire to be rich and how they've fallen into temptation, get rich, quick schemes, cheating people, taking advantage of people, ill gotten gains. Or how about 
a Bible teacher that you've respected for many years, and all of a sudden you're seeing this well-respected Bible teacher appearing on television networks that are preaching another Jesus and another gospel, and they're going to conferences with people who are known for being blatant heretics and false teachers. Has compromise caused them to do that? The desire to sell some more books, get out in front of a bigger audience? The Bible warns of us not to desire to become rich so that we would fall into temptation and compromise. Let's have a biblical worldview when it comes to money. And welcome back to Cross Talk, where we've got about eight minutes left in the program. We're going to move very quickly. We're going right now to Michael in Pensacola, Florida. Michael, you're on the air with Matt Staver. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll tell you, we, we're in a weird time in our life now. It seems that uh, anybody in the office or whatever, they're going to cave to, stay there, to save their job to keep their money. And uh, it's crying shame that uh, we go in that direction. Uh, like I live in Pensacola, Florida. At one time, the gay and lesbian made a proclamation that was going to make, make this a gay Riviera. And the first year they, they tried to do that, uh, restaurants and businesses did not really uh, adhere to them. Mm-hmm. But after the second mm-hmm. year, they, they, they opened up the welcome mat for them until, until they, they got a few dollars from it. Yeah, you know, if you go to these uh, so-called gay pride parades, uh, they don't hide the fact that this is all about sexual activity. I mean, they have... Uh, perverted acts out there, uh, and you can go to any of them. And, and it's not just uh, a parade. It is a sexual uh, celebration, celebration of uh, deviant kinds of sexual activity. You know, the caller that called in earlier, we've, we've seen this story many times where a young boy is molested sexually by another uh, family member or a friend or someone else. And oftentimes that causes a lot of confusion. It has damaging long-term consequences. Uh, there's many counselors that deal with trying to help repair people and bring them back to a, you know, a functioning uh, life. And but oftentimes that what that does is it ultimately uh, develops people who also engage in same-sex activity and sometimes even want to do the same thing to others that was done to them. And people have to work through those kinds of situations. They're trying to ban that kind of counseling out in California. That's what I'm arguing on April 17 at the Court of Appeals. They're trying to say that if you want to counsel someone to eliminate or reduce same-sex sexual behavior or attractions or identity, you can't do it. It's unethical. You would lose your license. They only want you to affirm it as normal, natural, and good. Um, And we have clients right now who are in counseling and they're benefiting. They want to stop that. This is this is a direct assault on the very core of our liberties and morality and marriage and even God. Greendale, Wisconsin, and Charles, you're on the air with Matt Staver. Hi, Matt. I, I have a couple of questions, but first I'd like to make real quickly just a couple of points. One, you mentioned the majority of people in prison that were raised in a home that had only one parent the majority of people in the prison system in America are black men. I know this because I tutor students That's in true. the black. Yeah. And yeah. It is a cultural epidemic, and it's not necessarily got to do with same-sex marriage. That is a cultural epidemic situation. No, I didn't say it does have to do with same-sex marriage. What I did say is that if, if you look what's happening in the black community, what's happening in the black community, the family has become deteriorated. Uh, fathers are not at the homes anymore. You have a huge fatherless syndrome society, and you have a huge disproportionate number of young black males that end up in prison. But it's not just black males. It's also white males and Hispanic males as well. Uh, Many of them end up in uh, jail or juvenile homes uh, because of a fatherless syndrome. Not all. I mean, I was raised in a fatherless home. I didn't end up in jail, so not everyone's going to be there. But Disproportionately, you're going to find that there is a correlation between people that grow up with a fatherless home and these young males that are incarcerated for violent crime. Now, same-sex marriage says that two boys, that a boy can be raised with, with two moms. That is permanently excluding dad from his life, but also skewing the view of the missing gender in a way that single-sex parenting does not. So it compounds the problem of the missing gender, the missing father. Let's go to Scott in Kansas. Scott, you're on the air. Okay. Thank you very much.
much for taking my call today. Uh, I just uh, don't really have any questions. I just want to make a comment. I want to thank you for your work, and I want to thank you because I'm one of these people that uh, I do have respect for people who are in same-sex uh, situations and lives. Um, and I know that because when I was in high school, I did have some of those tendencies, and I did act upon them. I've since repented, and I've been married for many, many years. I have five beautiful children, and we know that they're healthy and balanced because they have a loving mother and a father that are with them. The thing that is sad to me is that I don't get that same respect when I stand up and say, hey, this is what I believe. I respect you. I don't agree with you, but this is how I believe. But yet I am the one who's being chided and pointed at for simply by saying that, but yet somebody on the other side can say it, and they're cheered as somebody who's thinking different and thinking in this century. No, you're you're exactly right. I understand exactly what you're saying. You know, we need to treat all people with with dignity and respect. All of the everyone is made in the image of God. We're all sinners. We sin in multiple different ways. You know, we're we're born sinners, but we need to treat people that are made in the image of God with dignity. And every single person is. Uh, what we also find, however, is that when you get into this situation, just saying that marriage is the union of one man and one woman, uh, people now categorize you as a hater. That's hate speech, uh, saying that you can change. When you know people who have changed and come out of the homosexual lifestyle or behavior or identity, uh, they say that that's hateful behavior. And so there is a big intolerance by this other side against people of faith and morality. Got about one minute more. Beverly in Milwaukee. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, right to the I, point. I, yes, I was wondering why they don't uh, consider uh, this more as an illness uh, rather than, uh, you know, well, as God sees it, it's an abomination. Well, good question. Uh, I mean, it was uh, considered an illness up until 1973, and then the political pressure of the homosexual lobby uh, removed it from the American Psychological Association Diagnostic and Statistic Manual. There's still other things that are considered an illness, like transsexualism. They're trying to normalize that. They're trying to actually take it out of the uh, Diagnostic and Statistic Manual. The fact of the matter is, is that this is a sin. It's wrong, it's abnormal, and it's harmful behavior. It's not the normative behavior and it's not the normative relationship that we ought to foster and say that this is something that one ought to aspire to. And that's, in fact, what same-sex marriage would actually do. I think it's harmful in many, many ways, and that's a line we should not cross. Folks, I want to thank you for joining us. We don't have any more time for incoming calls, and sorry we missed Illinois, and uh, uh, we did get Milwaukee in there. But I want to thank those who are so patient in calling and, uh, Matt, we're so grateful. If you'd stay on just after the show, I do have some information for you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, folks, get online and check lc.org, lc.org. Now, this organization is fighting for the family, and I pray that uh, they may be strengthened, that young men and women will be challenged to prepare to uh, be the champions that will protect the family until the Lord Jesus comes. Thank you, Matt, for being with us. Thank you. My pleasure, Vic. Thanks for joining us today on Crosstalk. You've been listening to Crosstalk via satellite and the Internet from BCY America. Views expressed may or may not be those of this station. For a CD of today's program, send a donation of $6 or more to VCY Tape Ministry, 3434 West Kilbourne Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53208, or download by RSS or podcast from crosstalkamerica.com. And join us again for Crosstalk. Crosstalk.